Help presents Stress-Free Living with Ray Savage and Mr. Stress-Free, Ratanjit S. Sandhi. This audio program is an unscripted and unrehearsed conversation between Ray and Ratanjit. It is shared with you in hope of adding value to your life. We encourage you to listen to this program in its entirety to receive the full impact of its message. Sit back, relax, open your heart, mind, and soul to this edition of Stress-Free Living. Hello, everybody. I'm Ray Samich, and I'd like to introduce you all to my dear friend, colleague, co-host for nearly uh, three decades, Ratanjit Sandy. Ratanjit, how are you this fine morning? Wonderful, Ray. How are you? Excellent. Thank you. Always better when you and I have a chance to talk with each other. And we are joined this morning by a few people on our Zoom call, which we welcome everyone to join us. If you'd like the link to that, we'd be happy to share that with you on our YouTube channel, as well as on our Facebook channel and our website. And however you're joining us, if you are doing it live or on one of our stress-free living radio YouTube replays, that's a mouthful, uh, then uh, we enjoy having you with us. We have over 50 shows up there right now that are posted for you. So please feel free to watch those and uh, share those with your friends that may be interested also in the same topic. Ratanjit, I am extremely interested in this topic because you and I have spoken about ego many, many times about how that is an influence in our lives. It actually kind of takes over our personality in many cases due to our insecurities. The opposite of having ego, being egotistical, is being altruistic. It is caring about people. It is forgetting about myself and always trying to help others. And the topic today is, I think, a meaningful one. Is altruism dead? We just don't see it anymore. People still give money, but they usually do it for tax purposes. They usually do it for business purposes. They do it because maybe it makes them feel good, but is their heart really in the right place? And let's talk about that. Is, is that still the way people think? Are we designed to be altruistic? Is that something we learn to do? What do, you, what do you think about this topic today? Well, see, Ray, I invited a special expert to give us the worldly perspective of this. And his name is Professor Param Srikantya. Uh, Paramji, are you there? Yes, please. I'm right here. Thank you so much, Ratanji Ji, for referring to me as an expert. But I wouldn't claim any expertise on this subject other than the expertise that comes from living one's life in a world that is torn between the polarities of altruism and selfishness, as we all so, are on oh, an everyday basis. Give us the worldly perspective of uh, altruism. So how you see it? Well, uh, th th thank you for inviting my opinion. So I would tend to believe that altruism is far from dead. Altruism, in fact, is widely vis uh, there in the world. In fact, it's altruism that is helping the world go round every day. It's just that um, most of the altruism that's truly effective and makes a positive contribution is invisible. It is not visible. You go into any family, you will see grandmothers, grandfathers, um, people taking care of things, doing what is needed, taking care of the grandchildren. Uh, there's a lot that happens in terms of neighbors taking care of each other. There's a tremendous amount of it that happens. The problem is if we are looking at um, altruism as a very defined project of, um, you know, selfless participation in something that is designated and highlighted as an act of altruism, that might be uh, less and less visible. But I do believe that the real kind of altruism that is worth talking about is invisible. You know, there's been some research on invisible leadership that talks about the kinds of actions that some people engage in to help each other, to help the group going. These aren't individuals who are looking for credit. These aren't individuals looking to be celebrated. In fact, the very definition of altruism implies, as Ray earlier commented on, 
a sense of ego transcendence. You're transcending his ego. It, it is in not wanting necessarily to be recognized as an altruistic person that altruism comes to its fullest um, uh, expression. So therefore, here's a paradox. If you think if altruism is at a noticeable level, it's truly not altruist, altruism. It's something else masquerading as altruism. The only true altruism is something that's invisible and unnoticeable, and there's plenty of it. I also want to mention very quickly a perspective that has shaped my perception of altruism that comes from the Indian mystic Osho, who talked about altruism, so-called altruism, altruistic behavior driven by the, by the mind versus the heart. To him, as to uh, a lot of people who are exponents of the Eastern tradition, the mind is a very calculating, strategizing entity. Whatever it does, it does with a perspective of a return on investment, as opposed to the heart, which is spontaneous, which is not calculating. So there's a different kind of altruism when it, it feels different uh, as a phenomenon, and it emerges from the strategic and calculating mind, as opposed to it being an expression of the spontaneous heart. So that's another distinction that I would keep. And here, uh, I want to mention, like, for example, many of the wealthy countries or donors make a big uh, deal of, let's say, billions of dollars have been donated in international aid. Well, I have to tell you, uh, from the years that I worked in the World Bank, that there is uh, research that suggests that 99% of a lot of these international donations, which seem like flamboyantly altruistic behavior, never leave the shores of the donor country. Uh, they, you know, because often the donor, the the country that is donating, will set up requirements. For example, if they're uh, donating it to a third world country, they'll tell the so-called third world country this money has to be used on these projects. They will specify the projects that the country has to undertake. Many of these are projects that the recipient country doesn't even need. And then the donor country will also specify that you have to use one of our mine a country's contractors to carry out these projects. So there's an extremely uh, a complicated, subtle, but uh, calculating network of arrangements that are designed to ensure that the donation actually benefits more of the donor country than the recipient country. The reason I'm mentioning it is to illustrate the extent to which the human mind is so devious that it can call something as altruism, which is actually an expression of its precise opposite. Another quick perspective that I want to bring is a four stage uh, progression model of altruism. So think about it this way, and it's not, uh, so the first stage is, let's say, selfishness, Peace, a selfish person who's being unconsciously selfish. So they're just being unconsciously selfish in terms of they're not even aware of their selfishness and they're just taking care of their personal interest. Gradually, let's assume that a ray of so much, no, a ray of light, okay, <laughs> starts penetrating this barrier of, you know, this, uh, this, uh, the selfish armor consciousness arises, they become conscious of their selfishness in the sense that now they're no more robotically being selfish, but they're being conscious of those moments when they're selfish. So that's the second stage. So you're conscious, but selfish, and you're feeling uncomfortable about your own selfishness. The third step in this progression is conscious altruism. So you decide that it is not good to be selfish, and you start being altruistic, but since it's not a natural expression of how you're wired and who you are, you tend to become um, very conscious every time you're altruistic. And it's only the, uh, the mindful vigilance and presence of a sense of consciousness that ensures that you're being altruistic. Otherwise, you'd re relapse and regress into selfishness. But the highest level is the fourth step, where you become unconscious and altruistic, where you're unconsciously altruistic. It's just like you can tell the difference between somebody who has cultivated a very gentle demeanor out of you know, their desire to have good manners versus somebody who's gentle of spirit and gentle of nature and for whom gentleness is almost a natural way of being. So unconscious altruism uh, is when it becomes a natural way of being. 
So these are some of my perspectives. I, I, I could, later on, if it's relevant, we could talk about the history of altruism through the work of Freud and Adler and how they approached it. But I think this is enough to get us started <laughs> off. And I'm very grateful to you for inviting me to share these perspectives on the show. Again, as I said, hardly a expert, but someone who's always willing to insert himself into any conversation, not out of any sense of altruism, but merely because I love the sound of my own voice. <laughs> well, I must, I must tell you, doctor, that um, Ratsanjit for years, for I don't know, how many years, Ratsanjit, 25 years we've done this? 36 for, years. 36 years? 26. 26. 26. Okay, I was thought you said 36. I was going to say I'm not that old. 26 years we've been doing this. But what's amazing is that I always, he always gives me so many branches of the tree to try to go through. And then so many leaves of the tree of each branch that I have to follow up on. And you have just done the same thing. Okay. You have just <laughs> given us so many different ways that we can continue and discuss this. And I am just uh, elated that you have brought so much to our discussion here today. Thank you again for doing that. Thank uh, you so, so let's much. go back to the first one, because I tried to take notes when I realized that you were going to give me an avalanche of, of wisdom. <laughs> the, the, the idea that true altruism is invisible is a tremendous place to start, because what we all do see of course, when, when people give freely, whether it's the corporations, whether it's celebrities, whether it's CEOs, whatever it is, this is what makes the newspaper. This is what makes the, you know, the, uh, the media attention. And of course, as you said, you used the word calculated quite a few times. These are calculated demonstrations of supposed altruism. And it's so interesting that you said true altruism is invisible because it's, it's kind of like um, when, when you see ego, it's the absence of security. And when you see supposed altruism, it's really the absence of, of altruism, right? Um, so it, it's, it totally changes the, the discussion when what we think is altruism isn't really altruism. And when I ask the question, is altruism dead? You know, is, is calculated altruism dead? Maybe should have been the question because, um, and, and is true altruism dead? You know, I guess the answer clearly is no, in your opinion, right? Yeah. Yes, clearly no. In fact, I would say that the more the level of selfishness in the world increases, there's a, you know, it's almost like the dialectics of progress. On the other side, altruism also swells in its presence in order to compensate for it. And that's why despite all the wars, all the brutality, all the selfishness, you still see human beings able to live their lives because somewhere there's an invisible transcendental force that's asserting itself against the dominant wave of selfishness in order to compensate for it. Ratanji, what, what are your thoughts on that? Is, is, do you believe too that the true altruism is is still peaking around us? Well, see, there's a, uh, before I get into that, I would like to bring in a very uh, interesting article which was published on uh, uh, October 25th, 2015 in New York Times. <clears throat> and it says, how salad can make us fat? If you eat salad, it defies the common sense, right? How salad can make us fat. And basically they are talking about a term called moral licensing. Moral licensing means that if you have been dieting for a whole week and now you say, okay, it comes a weekend, Saturday is okay. This is my uh, free day. I'm going to eat everything I want. So that, is what happens when you are on salad diet, you go start cheating. So what happens is in, in uh, how this thing relates to what we are talking here is that once we do something, you know, in our society, there are over uh, 
170 billion dollars equivalent of that in salary which is being uh, donated as volunteers there are so much volunteer work done in this country and then there are donations charitable donations which amount to 4 billion over 4 billion dollar a year and 70% of that comes from ordinary people so we are very giving and very uh, helping society but at the bottom of this there are two forces which have to be recognized one force is our internal inherent desire to do good and the other force is that i want to look good i want to present myself good so when we do volunteer work there are some people who do volunteer work to to enhance their resume or there are some people who do volunteer work to satisfy their inner quest to be helpful so these two things have to be recognized so when it is driven by what paramji said by mind which is manipulative then we are working for enhancing our resume we give charity to feel good. We want our name to be blasted on, on something where we are giving money. So, uh, and the same thing, you want to look good in your subconsciously or in your own eyes or in the world's eyes. But there is another force within you, which is always has a desire. And that force comes from uh, sometimes it happens without your knowledge. If you are in a crowd and you are a, a older a elder gentleman in front of you and somehow he slips and tries to fall down, your impulse is automatically to go catch him, to help him. You are not doing anything good. That is your inner impulse, which automatically happens to you. So there is a goodness in all of us. And there is a manipulative mind in all of us. So if we become aware of these two elements, then we can regulate them. We can control them. Right? You know, to your, to your very last point, there are so many times that we hear heroic stories of people. You just said somebody, an elder gentleman slips in front of you and you try to help them. But there's, and, and that's, a, that's a great example, but there are exaggerated examples of that, emph emphatic examples of that, where recently, for example, um, someone jumped into the water to save someone who was coming across the southern border in the United States and they ended up dying. It was one of the border agents that ended up dying, trying to save someone who they had not known at all. They never met them. They didn't know anything about their family life. If they were you know, a, 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 a murderer or, or a priest, they didn't know anything about who they were, what they were, what their background was. But when they saw somebody struggling in the water, they jumped in to save them. And sadly, they, they died. When you hear about that, you have to say there's something going on inside of our bodies, inside of our hearts, inside of our minds, our souls, whatever it is, that just says, I was born to help people. I was born to do something that I don't even know why I'm doing it. I don't even understand why I'm, who I'm doing it for, but I am called to take action. And when those examples come up, I think we should all stop and think for a second. If those heroes are willing to go to even risk their own life, then is there something that we are wired to do, to be, that we should think more about instead of masking how we act? You're, let, let's go back to, to our, our special guest here on that. Do you think that we are? I, I think they, with the four stages. Are we wired that way? 
If you need to take a break, otherwise we, we like, can't. We can right after right after we get a quick answer on this one because okay, I can't fine, wait through the break fine. for this one. All right. <laughs> do you do you think when you talk about the four stages of being selfish and all these other kind of things, do you think that if we let the world go by, that we actually would always be in a true altruistic state? Well, there, this has this is actually a question that has been historically examined both by political philosophers and sociologists and psychologists. And clearly there are two dominant camps. One camp that believes that human nature is inherently selfish and self-serving and, you know, it's Darwin's uh, survival of the fittest and a rival camp that doesn't get a lot of press. And why doesn't don't they get a lot of press? They believe that human nature is inherently slanted towards cooperative consciousness. It's a camp represented by social philosophers like Peter Kropotkin and others uh, who believe that human nature is very altruistic. And um, part of the reason it doesn't get a lot of press, in my opinion, is that the dominant economic models of today favor the idea that human beings are inherently selfish. And because economists believe in that and they have unfortunately become the most powerful uh, lobby within the social sciences, I think they have been able to regulate and control the dialogue and somehow favor those representations, uh, conceptual representations that suggest that human beings are selfish. I would tend to uh, side with those social philosophers who believe that human beings are wired to be helping each other. That if, and these are biological biologists who have shown the amazing examples of cooperation that occurs in all forms of life on the planet, between insects, between bees, between you know birds, and all of that. And that's the view there. So I want to pause. I know that you're probably moving towards a break, so I should be parsimonious in my um, <laughs> response. All right. Thank you so much. You've given us something great to launch our further discussion on when we come back from this break with Ratanjit. Um, Param uh, Srikantya, am, am yeah. I saying that You can just all? call me Param. Param, Param. is fine. Okay. Param is fine. All right. And, uh, and so many of our other guests that we're going to have a chance to uh, talk with during our break when you're hearing a couple of messages from some of the people that are making this show possible on the radio. Thank you so much for being with us on this edition of Stress-Free Living. We'll be back in just a minute. Don't you go away. All right. Uh, any of our other guests, if you've got a quick thought, we've got about 90 seconds here. We'd love to hear from you. You can unmute yourself and please participate and give us your feedback and questions. Or not, don't, don't feel obligated, but if you have anything you'd like to say or check in with or ask a question, we can hear from you now. No, I guess we're not gonna get any this time around. Yeah. That's okay. Uh, I, I am getting, Ratanjit, I am getting a barrage today by people, first timers, and I'm not letting them in because if we don't know who they are, we are risking. Who, 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 who are um, no, they're coming up with different names. And that, you know, could be, again, intentionally trying to. One was one was called oneness, you know. Um, one was called mommy. We, we got all kinds of names coming through that I don't recognize. So I'm not admitting them. So we have to do a little better job of addressing that to people. If they want to be a part of this, they need to let us know who they are. Okay. Very much appreciate the direction that we are taking on this. Thank you so much. Let, let's come back with, maybe, maybe we'll uh, start with that four stages you made all these other good points, but maybe that's where we should go because if, you know, either way, whatever the camp is in, if we're wired to be good or wired to be selfish, um, that four stages is relevant because we can either do it subconsciously or consciously make that change. This is Stress Free Living. Welcome back. Ray Samich with you and Ratanjit Sandi. And our special guest, Param, is with us as well, who is uh, giving us a lot of insight on our particular topic here today, which is talking about altruism. The question is altruism dead? And we have come to talk about, well, 
Is there a real altruism, a true altruism that kind of happens behind the scenes invisibly and perhaps is at a biggest level ever? Uh, we do hear more than ever before grandparents are raising their grandchildren uh, because of what has gone on economically in many households, what has gone on with uh, the separation of, of uh, many couples, many married couples, uh, many couples that have children and never get married, and that leaves the children, the grandchildren, kind of on their own. And so I know that uh, that area of altruism is, is the highest. There are more grandparents raising grandchildren than ever before in the history. So that's just one example. There's so many other ones. Let's talk about the four stages of becoming truly unconsciously altruistic. Doctor, if, if it is true that we all migrate from selfish to unconsciously altruistic, it doesn't really matter if we're wired to be selfish or wired to be good. It seems like we can do that transition. We can go through those four stages if we choose to. Would, would you agree with that? Yes, uh, if we choose to, and that's where the challenge is because so much of the external world we live in is designed to ignite and tap into the selfish side of human nature. Our institutions are based on assumptions that are inimical to altruism. We have job descriptions, but you know, many organizational scholars who have studied organizations say that what makes organizations great is not the fact that people are complying with job descriptions. What makes an organization great is another phenomenon called organizational citizenship behavior, where people far exceed what they're required to do, where people far exceed what they're accountable to do. The greatest organizations are those where, where individuals are not necessarily limited by the uh, psychic prison that the job description creates and seek constantly to push the boundaries on that and make voluntary contributions inspired by their own sense of creativity rather than by a sense of meeting a requirement. So I would say that, it, yeah, the progression is not guaranteed. It is something that happens either as a result of the external environment um, you know, creating more uh, conditions favorable for the germination of altruism. You know, it's also almost like altruism is a seed that exists within us, but whether it will germinate fully and whether it will become that tree, to use one of your earlier metaphors, is based both upon the intentions of the individual and some people are moving towards the spiritual light. They might listen to Ratanji shows and, and be awakened to a sense of a, a, a oneness to a sense of possibility to the vastness of the cosmic scheme and then decide to move towards the light you know and it's almost like and and that too is another uh, uh, belief among many people that human beings are heliotropic heliotropic meaning just like plants are moving towards the light we have an inherent wiring and a propensity to move towards the light it's just that um, it requires a little extra effort because the deck is uh, stacked so much in favor of the, uh, the selfishness end of that uh, polarity. Ratsanjit, what do you think? Which, which camp are you in? Do you, do you believe that we're wired to be selfish or wired to be altruistic? Well, see, we are systematically taught information and put in data in our mind which are many times contrary to who we are. And that is why all our stress, all our frustration, all our anger, all our in, in, incorrect decision-making happens. We are never given to understand how I am designed, who I am really. And if you are not totally aware of your own self, and you are constantly trying to be what world has labeled you to be, and you are trying to live that artificial label, then at best, first of all, you are going to be mediocre at whatever you do. And you are constantly living in the noise, which is your 
mind is your brain is making based on half baked information and then all the other noise which is being thrown at you by media and newspaper and books and lectures and everything else so you never really look into a quiet place to reconnect yourself reconnect to the how you are you are designed so it's it's, it's like if you have a equipment which is designed to do something else but you use for totally a different purpose it it, it is not going to uh, perform at its optimum level so that is the fundamental thing which has gone wrong with humanity because we have never been uh, taught or or given to understand how we are designed what who are we so fundamentally those questions if they are not answered all the knowledge of the world doesn't help you all, all the knowledge of the world when they are applied through you who you are then they are in peace with you then you are uh, coordinating with all this information and living the way you are supposed to live in harmony with your own self so that's the problem. there's a um... When listening to both of you answer that, there's something that strikes me as being uh, an impact on the two factors coming together. One is that you said you suggest that we don't take the time to know who we are. We don't ask the questions. We don't know who we are. We don't, no matter how much education or awareness we have, we, we don't have that fundamental knowledge. Our, our guest, Pradam, says that the world is overwhelming us with all reasons why we should be selfish. The, and, and I'm very familiar with the advertising industry that is spending literally billions and trillions of dollars trying to tell us we need better cars, we need better homes, we need better fashion, uh, we, we, we should be greedy, we, we deserve it, we, we only go around once and, and you have to grab it all. Um, and so the, the consistency though is that both of those whether it's because we don't know who we are and we don't ask the question to know that or whether we are kind of out of it and not even asking the question but we are being overwhelmed by the world telling us to be selfish the end result is the same the end result is that we go along with what the world is telling us to do and what the world is telling us to do is either be selfish, just take care of yourself, or it's saying, if you are gonna be generous, do it in a calculated manipulative way so that you get credit. So it takes you up the ladder to success. And it's, it's kind of telling me that it doesn't matter what camp you're in. And, and I, I know you, you've researched intense uh, studies on this, uh, Param, so maybe I'm, maybe I'm wrong. This is just my interpretation, but it doesn't really matter what camp you're in if we're being barraged by the world and if we're not asking the right questions, <laughs> which is where both of you are coming from. It leads to the fact that that true altruism, I mean, not true altruism, but altruism in, in the way we think of it is really dead because of those two reasons. Any, any comment? Am I, am I off base on this or am I, is this kind of the way it is? Pardon? Yeah, no, you're not at all off base. I think uh, that was a very fair and uh, balanced summary. Yes, absolutely. It doesn't matter how we are wired. We live in a socially constructed reality. So it's important to distinguish between two dimensions of reality, the objective reality of what is, and that holds true. For example, disciplines like chemistry, physics are dealing, grappling with the objective realities of object materials and objects and all of that. But in almost the, all of our lives, we don't live in that objective reality. We live in what's called a socially constructed reality, which is constituted by the stories and interpretations we are making up constantly on a moment to moment basis. And every interpretation I make influences how I will act. Because if I perceive Ratanjit to be a kind person 
how I relate to him will be very different than if I perceive Ratanji to be a selfish person. So our perceptions, our interpretations are constantly guiding our behavior. And here is where the conundrum of what Eastern mystics have called the chattering monkey comes into existence. It's the idea that there's a voice in our shoulder that is sitting here and constantly talking to us, making up stories and interpretations. And that symbolizes the human mind. Now, the human mind is heavily conditioned by the society in which it lives. And therefore, the internal dialogue that is going on continuously could be reinforcing an altruistic conception or worldview. And the worldview of oneness, which is the reality of oneness, is often eclipsed by the constant chatter of the mind, which is making us encapsulated and isolated in the spirit in which Ratanji talks about our separated separation as an optical delusion. You know, he often quotes how he was inspired by Einstein himself to recognize that there's an optical delusion of separation and isolation that is created. And that is what our mind absorbs. And once the mind absorbs that, there's the constant inner chatter of the mind, which is reinforcing these views of separateness. And those perceptions become the basis for how we act. So we get trapped in this never ending, interminable, vicious cycle of stories, behavior, and then when we act selfishly, obviously people will respond with more selfishness, and then the stories continue. Then our mind again says, look, I knew people were selfish. Thank goodness I was not altruistic because when I did this, here's how this gentleman responded. So it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. And the idea of the self-fulfilling prophecy is that whatever you believe in becomes reality. If I set out saying, people are altruistic throughout the day and I maintain this assumption, everything that I see around me will be altruistic because that's the lens through which I'm interpreting everything that I see. If I believe on the other hand that people are selfish, I will act in ways that I will actually incite the environment to confirm my suspicions, my paranoia and my assumption. So here's the catch 22 about beliefs. All beliefs are true. Why? Because the human mind is so committed to uh, enacting the realities that we believe in, the fictions that we have bought into, are the ones that will always get validated at the end of the day, because our desire to engage, to preserve our beliefs results in what's called selective perception. And through the principle of selective perception, we end up. And that is why it is so important, The ra this radio show is so important, because it, <clears throat> it lights a lamp in an otherwise dark chamber reminds us of our oneness because in being reminded of our oneness are there's an opportunity that our worldview will be altered and through that we will actually begin to experience ourselves not as the individual wave trying to make a splash but as the ocean itself and that's the di uh, di duality we have to tread each of us has a desire to be a wave and we want to be spectacular. Param wants to make some super luminous contributions to this discussion and be remembered as, oh, that guest Param. But at the same time, the irony is that real contribution happens only when Param is willing to die as a wave. What does that mean? That Param becomes, or any of us, we become so enchanted with the undercurrent of wisdom, with the ocean of wisdom, that we want to bring the ocean of wisdom of oneness forward, not the dynamic, um, you know, like the great man or great woman theory of trying to um, feed our otherwise perverse impulses towards narcissistic self-glorification. Beautiful. Oh, so beautiful. So beautifully spoken. Uh, we do need it to go to a break. When we come back from this break, we, we want to try to, we always try to end the show by saying how to get better. Okay, how do we take what we've learned and apply it? And I think we wanna go back to the four stages. How can we evolve from the selfish people that we probably are, whether it's wired that way or whether it's the world has taught us that way and encouraged us and our mind is convincing us to be that way. How can we evolve as a human being, as part of oneness uh, to become unconsciously altruistic? And is that even possible for all of us? We're going to come back and discuss that. So stay right where you are. This is Stress-Free Living. 
Wonderful. All right. We have once again about 90 seconds. We welcome anybody. If you have any thoughts on this or questions you'd like us to ask, now's the time. Unmute yourself and speak, please. So we are not getting any feedback. We are not. This is unusual. I think no, it is a great talk. It is a great talk. Oh, thank, thank you. Any so, any uh, any questions to add or comments to make? Uh, no, I think uh, I am with the first thought that we are not. Uh, we are basically wired as uh, helping each other. I am for that, but the education system and the society is leading us towards that side, the other side of it. Even at our home, even at our uh, even childhood training, everything is leading towards the other side, making us selfish. I, I tend to agree with you. Thank you, Jeffrey. Thank you, Doctor. Anybody else have a quick thought or comment or question? Yeah, I just okay. wanted to point out the importance of equality in altruism. So there's a, this is the hidden part of the altruistic iceberg that we have to know, feel very deeply that we are all equal. Otherwise, any kind of altruism becomes ego serving if we see the other as less than us. And our altruism is driven by our desire to help these poor people. It's a very I, subtle I, form I, of egoism. We'll hold that thought and put it. It's a brilliant thought, but I don't know if we're going to be able to get to that in the in because that's its own big conversation. So, please don't forget that thought. But we, I don't know if we'll get to it today. We may have to do a part two with you. <laughs> just about can I pitch back. in and ask a question? I, I I'm so sorry, but you waited too long. We're coming back. Okay, sure. We are back on Stress-Free Living, Ratanjit Sandhi, Ray Samich, and Param with us, our special guest, and we have been talking about altruism. Is it dead? What is the real, true altruism in life? Are we wired to be that way? Are we wired to be selfish? What effect does the world have on us? Um, what effect, and, and as one of our guests stated, what, what effect does our education system have on this? Are we taught the right things when we go to kindergarten and, and college and everything in between? What about our parents? What are our parents teaching us? Or what are they maybe teaching us but not showing us uh, as the examples, as the role models that they should be in our life? So I think from that perspective, Maybe it's easier to talk about going through the four stages, not for what we do for ourselves, but going through the four stages, which is selfish, which is being conscious that we are selfish. The third stage being conscious when we are altruistic. And the fourth stage is being altruistic unconsciously. When we go through that, let's talk about how we teach that to our children, how we can show that and exemplify that to the next generation. Let me, let me be a little bit crazy and say that it's too late to save me, but can I save my kids? Can I teach them how to go through these four stages so they have a fulfilling life? So how do we do that? How do we, is it teachable? It, can we can we tell somebody, will they admit that they are selfish at that very first stage? Or is that something that even at that number one stage, we don't want to admit it and we don't want to believe that we can be anything other than who we are? Either one of you can answer this question. Rataji? Uh, let, let, let me get a quick feedback yeah. from Param and then I'll... I'll... Okay. Param Thank Ji, you. what is Thank your feedback? Thank you. I believe that <clears throat> there are certain other preconditions for altruism to flourish. One of it is authenticity. The paradox here is it's only when I can accept myself fully and love myself fully that I will allow myself to see those ways in which I am selfish, unkind, cruel, angry. So there's a dark side to me and there's the light, but it's only when I can see the darkness within me that the light can enter. The challenge is that so many of us hate ourselves so much, have rejected ourselves, have condemned ourselves, that we are not able to be with 
uh, this level of authenticity to see reality for what it is. It is only, and when we demonize ourselves or other people, that tendency just becomes even more pronounced. So if I have a tremendous need to see myself as selfish, uh, as I'm sorry, as altruistic, I will not allow myself to see the ways in which I'm being selfish. To be able to accept myself as a selfish person, I have to then understand the roots of my selfishness. Because often selfishness was a response to, to threatening situations where I felt powerless, where I felt inadequate, where I felt an overwhelming sense of scarcity. And it was my response of self-preservation. And that's how selfishness arises in moments of insecurity where we learn to fight for our own self-preservation and that became an entrenched way of being. So I would say that authenticity is very important to accept all parts of us, to accept the part of me that's selfish and to accept the part of me that's altruistic. When I reach to that level of self-acceptance, then it is possible for me to undertake the pilgrimage towards altruism. Ratanjit, what's your take? The original question, which Haram definitely answered there, his, his ideas on it, what are your ideas? If, if I am selfish myself, will I admit that as, as a starting point? Or don't I even think I am? Don't I see it? And if I'm trying to teach my children, how do I move them from that selfish first stage? Well, see, until, unless we realize the truth about ourselves, because everything is relative, relative truth, I, I see word from my own perception. And if I do not change that perception to be correct, then I will continue to see the word erroneously. And what I'm saying here is that we talked about in our, our earlier shows that the truth about me is this that I am placed here in this human uniform. And if I presume myself to be, I am this human uniform, I am the white, I am a male, I am old, I am young, I'm Asian, I'm Indian. They're all definition of this human uniform. And this human uniform is designed to protect itself and as a consequence, it is always parked in fear. It is always looking for uh, enough to feed itself. It is parked in greed. It, it considers itself to be a separate entity. It is parked in ego. So in that assumption, in that reality, we, I will always play the game of this, what is in it for me and I'm doing something good and I need credit. But once I realize the real me is residing within this human body and the real me is the same enlivening force which is present in anyone and everyone I come across. Once I begin to focus on the enlivening force present in me and, and others, that is where selfless adding value, making a difference, serving and altruism all comes into place. Anything practiced in the human body mode, regardless of how we place and how we label it, it is always going to uh, want a credit. It is always going to be ego oriented because body is part in the ego mode. Although I say, I, I don't want any ego. So when we do certain things without thinking, we, without knowing, we become in the oneness mode. And that is where the true altruism comes into place. In the human body mode, now there's nothing wrong with us thinking in the human body mode. Human body is a gift given to us. We must respect that. We must take care of it. We must serve the human body. It is not that something we need to take it for granted. It is a gift to us. We should forever be grateful for this 
gift given to us as a human body. It allows us to experience this life and, but never forget that who we are is not the human body. Who we are is the divine force present in all of us, giving us life. And that force has to be constantly served and respected and seen. And that force can only be experienced when we live in the present, right? Well, Param used the, when he was saying a lot of what you said, but he used entirely a different set of terms than you are using, but he referred to living in the darkness and, it, and admitting that there's a dark side of us and then being able to move to the light, to see the light. And then that allows us to have the true altruism. It seems that there's a parallel here in terms of the darkness is thinking about me as a human being. That's who I am. Um, man, woman, old, young, white, black, yellow, whatever it is, versus the, the light being the oneness, the, the light that we come to realizing that it's not all about me. It's not all about my human body and all the titles and, and education and everything. So am I right in that consistency? Param, I'll go back to you. It, the way that Ratanji talked about oneness and realizing that that's who we really are, could that be the dark versus the light that you alluded to? Absolutely. I think uh, Ratanjit uh, spoke a tr incontrovertible truth. And I think the beauty of his words, I would like to spend a couple of minutes if we have that to bring that out. So, um, because uh, I think in education, um, I, I know that the Indian mystic Osho pointed out that there have been two paradigms in education. One paradigm believes that man is fundamentally born into truth and then falls into error. And therefore, the purpose of education is to take him or her back to the original truth, to awaken the truth. The metaphor here, he says, is of a mirror that has become covered with dust. You have to wipe the mirror clean so that it can reflect again and shine forth. That's one school. And I believe in so much of what Ratanjit said um, is actually in that paradigm. The other paradigm, which is more Western, in more of the Western wisdom traditions is that man is born in sin and in error, and he has to be led to the truth. So then your strategies are going to be totally different. In one, you are dealing with oneness, with the sacred side of human nature as fundamental and axiomatic, and what you have to do is awaken that. The other thing that I, uh, that Ratanjit's, uh, what Ratanjit just articulated led me to believe is to see the distinction between three levels of life. Life happens at the level of having the things that you possess, doing the things that you uh, can do, perform observable actions, and being who you are. Now, Osho, the Indian mystic, talks about three forms of education. Teaching is where you teach people knowledge. So you can teach people knowledge. You can start thinking about how do I teach this child altruism? Training is at the level of doing, at the level of actions. So you train a person to undertake altruistic actions and to engage in altruistic behavior. But so many of the Eastern traditions, you know, um, um, Osho says, is predicated on another approach called transmission, where you don't teach anything at the level of knowledge or skill. It's actually a form of contagion of a state of consciousness. In other words, I would answer your question by saying, don't ever worry about teaching your children anything. Your own house is in disarray. Set your own house right. You awaken to Ratanjit, follow Ratanjit's advice and step into that consciousness of oneness. Because when you have stepped into that consciousness of oneness, you don't need to teach anybody anything. The knowledge and skill level becomes completely irrelevant. You are influencing other people through the power of your own being. It's almost like one candle can light 50 other candles. It's transmission. The light of the lamp. The lighting of the lamp is what it's called. It proceeds by transmission. So I would say it's an invisible exchange that happens between people, a contagious exchange of consciousness 
So just like we can give COVID to each other, we can actually, through contagion, you know, pass on the, um, you know, the, um, the condition of altruism. And then you're never being intentional about it. So it's about how do I inhabit a state of being and then the rest will follow. Beautiful. It is so beautiful. And uh, it is time for us to go. Ratanjit, uh, your wisdom is always so amazing. But I want to thank you for bringing Param to our show here today because his insight on this has also been wonderful. I would definitely like to continue this because I, I think that we have accomplished a lot, but there's so much more that we can talk about in our journey to oneness and our journey to being truly altruistic, which is the intent, I do believe, for all of us. Param, thank you for your wisdom, uh, for all of our different guests that have joined us today, and most especially to you, Ratajay, as always. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. All right. And remember, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we thank you for being with us. We're all playing the same game. Have a great day. We'll talk to you again real soon.